number of sources the antenna can resolve. So say the antenna has 20 dB gain, that means that the antenna has, um, can resolve 100 sources in the sky. We generally think of gain as meaning that if we put one watt in this antenna in the beam direction, we get the same power uh, with our one watt as we would with 100 watts in a non-directional antenna. But for radio telescopes, we consider the resolution as being a very important quantity. The Ohio State University Radio Telescope at Delaware has about 60 dB gain, which means that it can resolve one million sources in the sky. And we have done sky mapping and have mapped, have observed and mapped uh, tens of thousands of radio sources well below the, the theoretical limit that we could uh, actually uh, resolve. The quantity that I mentioned earlier, the effective aperture, is best uh, considered if you're thinking about the antenna as a receiving device. Here we have a horn. Uh, an incident uh, power per unit area, S, is watts per square meter. The horn collects it, feeds it into a receiver, and the power available to the receiver, if everything's matched up and lossless, is equal simply to the power per unit area times an aperture, A sub E. Or this aperture is equal to the received power over the incident power density. For any antenna, regardless of what it is, there is always a uniquely defined uh, effective aperture um, in square meters. And this comes into this expression. We can define the directivity in terms of the effective aperture over the square of the wavelength times 4 pi, and putting this relation and the other one for d involving the beam solid angle together, we get this very useful relation that the product of the beam solid angle and the effective aperture is the square of the wavelength. So if you know one of these in your wavelength, you know the other. Now, I would like to point out that an antenna and receiver is a remote sensing device. Here's where the temperature comes in. If you have a resistor, at a temperature T, you will get a noise power in watts per hertz proportional to the absolute temperature in Kelvin degrees times this constant, that's Boltzmann's constant. If you replace this resistor by a dipole antenna that's at the focus of, say, a parabola with the antenna pattern out here, now you will measure a temperature here of this <coughs> radiation resistance, T sub A, which is proportional to the power received in watts per hertz over Boltzmann's constant. And I wish to emphasize that this antenna temperature is not the temperature of the antenna structure. If it's a lossless antenna, has the antenna temperature, the physical temperature, has nothing to do with it. This temperature is a measure of the temperature of the distant regions of space that are coupled back to the antenna by the radiation resistance. So a receiving system is really like a radiometer where you've got um, a sensitive device and through the antenna and field pattern you are projecting your connections out and measuring the temperatures of distant regions in space. It's a radiometer very definitely. Suppose, for example, that the antenna has an effective aperture of 10 square meters, receiving a 10 kilohertz bandwidth signal of one microvolt per meter. Now, you'd say one microvolt per meter. That's fairly weak. I mean, that's nothing terribly strong. Well, then the received power uh, figures out to about 3 times 10 to the minus 10th watts, rather low power. but when you figure out what the equivalent antenna temperature is, put that in here and you put 
Boltzmann's constant, which is a very small number, and the bandwidth in here, you find that the equivalent antenna temperature is 2 billion Kelvin degrees. You're looking at a very hot, hot object. And you probably don't realize it, but your television transmitting antennas, your antennas would look to a radiometer as uh, something that's uh, in the millions or billions of, of degrees. This is an equivalent black body temperature. It doesn't mean that your uh, antenna is melting down or anything like that. Now, the minimum detectable temperature of a receiving system is equal to what's called the system temperature, divided by a statistical quantity involving the bandwidth and the integration time. For the OSU radio telescope, we have a system temperature of about 50 Kelvin, bandwidth of 100 kilo of 100 megahertz, and time constant of about four seconds, so that our minimum detectable temperature is a few thousandths of a Kelvin degree. The signal to noise for this signal received with our telescope would be the ratio of this TA over this minimum, and it comes out to be 10 to the 12th, uh, one trillion signal to noise ratio, or 120 dB. With big signals like that, uh, people don't really worry very much about um, the system temperature and the minimum detectable signal. In fact, uh, under many cases, it's, uh, it's not worth considering. But when you're working a system down to the limits, it certainly is. And for radio astronomy, for remote sensing, the temperature is very important. Suppose the radio telescope is looking out into space, and here is an emitting object at a temperature T sub s. If there was nothing intervening, the antenna temperature would be this. You would be measuring it. But suppose in between there is a cloud, a plasma, or something that is both an emitting and absorbing cloud. Then the antenna temperature that you measure is given by uh, this expression, where the source temperature is attenuated by the cloud, and there is an extra term due to the emission and absorption by the cloud. In remote sensing, you take a radio telescope up and put it on a satellite and turn it around and look back at the Earth. So here's the same telescope up uh, on a satellite looking at the Earth. If you're looking directly at the Earth with nothing intervening, you would measure a temperature T sub E. That's the Earth temperature. If there's a big forest in between at a temperature T sub S, T sub F, then the observed antenna temperature up there on the satellite would have this relation here. You have some loss by going through the forest, and you have a contribution of emission and absorption by the forest, exactly the same as in this uh, situation above where you're looking in space. And it's with this kind of a setup that it is possible with these uh, remote sensing satellites to make survey large areas of the Earth and from these various coefficients determine a great deal about the temperature of the Earth, reflection coefficient, the absorption of the forest or the corn fields or wheat fields or what, what have you, uh, do a tremendous amount of surveying on a large scale that has never been possible before. And this is a basic equation that is used in that work. Down here, Let's uh, place ourselves at the receiver terminals of a receiver connected by a transmission line of length L to an antenna. The transmission line has a physical temperature. This is what you'd measure putting a thermometer on it. And it has emission and absorption. It will have emission unless you cool it down to absolute zero. So. Uh, there is a contribution from the transmission line, emission and absorption, and there is attenuation of the antenna temperature that you receive back there. And the interesting thing is that the equation and the relations for this system, transmission line, remote sensing, and a radio telescope are all mathematically identical. <coughs> Thank you.
So we have two ways to go, and we often have to go both ways. One way with antenna systems is we study the three-dimensional field patterns, use Maxwell's equations, we have space vectors, function of angle, two angles, distance, and time. Or we can go the other route and deal only with simple scalars, radiation resistance, antenna temperature, beam area, directivity, gain, and effective aperture. <coughs> That uh, concludes phase two of my talk, and I would like now to go to the part I like best, that's the demonstration. I'm five minutes behind. That's for, that's for them. Boy, they, they really check up on you here. They're timing you, everything. <coughs> um, <laughs> this is a three centimeter transmitter. 3 centimeter, power 10 milliwatts, modulated about 1 kilohertz. This is a receiver, very simple receiving device, feeding the output modulation into a loudspeaker so that as I move this around and probe the field, you can tell by the intensity of the sound, what's going on. You don't have to watch a meter up there jumping around and look at what I'm doing. You can just watch what I'm doing and your ear will tell you what's, uh, <clears throat> what's happening. We're on the air. You can see the field coming out is quite well defined, just like the pattern I showed in the picture. <clears throat> Now, it's very, fairly narrow beam width. <coughs> now, if I move this one, 
you see i have to move it more to cut it out that means this has a broader pattern if we could draw balloons on here this would be a sort of a uh, zeppelin coming out of here and this would look like a hot air balloon over on this one a uh, wide pattern small aperture this is about one square wavelength that's maybe 10 so there's quite a difference in the patterns of these two if i move this away we observe that it goes down that's the 1 over r effect for field or 1 over r square effect for power now notice <coughs> i turn this and it cuts out that's polarization this is vertically polarized this is polarized that way. When polarizations agree, we get signal. When I cross polarize them, it cuts out. <clears throat> My hand cuts off the signal. My hand also acts as a reflector. I'm not getting anything here, but I'm getting something back. If I put the receiving horn here, picking up some of this, and in a position to get something from here, listen. You can hear that I'm moving through a standing wave pattern from each max to the next max, I have moved one half wavelength. And if we had a meter stick up here, you'd see that was 15 millimeters or one and a half centimeters. Now, <clears throat> here's my hand. There are my fingers. Comes through my fingers, notice. Doesn't go through the palm, but it goes through the fingers. I turn the fingers vertically and it cuts out. My fingers are a grid. They reject when the polarization is parallel to the fingers and the signal goes through when it's perpendicular. So my fingers are a, can act as a grid. Let me repeat that experiment with the, uh, I did with my hand and getting the standing waves using uh, this uh, thing here it has a sheet of aluminum on here an aluminum sheet I can demonstrate that here you see there's specular reflection when I get it turned just right I get a signal out and back angle of reflection equal to the angle of incidence all that sort of thing and it works very well there but I don't get much back when it's turned at other angles now, this works better than my hand, and besides, my hand was getting hot. So, um, <laughs> you get the standing wave effect very, very nicely. Now this, you notice, reflects very strong. But if I just turn it over, I don't get anything. Nothing. Nothing at all. Wouldn't you like to have some of that to put on your car as a fuzz buster? <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it's, it's cheap. Um, you just get what is called space cloth or space paper. I have some paper here that has a Resistance per square, any square you cut out measured from two opposite sides has 377 ohms. That's the impedance of space. And I backed it up with that aluminum sheet that was reflecting off the other side. So this is a dual purpose um, device here. And this absorbing material with a quarter wave behind a reflecting sheet completely absorbs the incident signal. The 
it's a beautiful demonstration of the fact that physically space has an impedance, 377 ohms, uh, approximately, and coincidentally, um, equal to approximately 2 pi times 60, but it has nothing to do with the power frequency. It's coincidental. Now, here is uh, the signal coming through, good and strong. I have here a little paddle, paddle. I put it in, nothing happens. Doesn't do anything, but I turn it over. Cuts it off, cuts it off completely. Flip it over, it goes through, turn it over, nothing. I must have some kind of uh, unidirectional device in there. Um, no, not Zener diodes, but uh, you know, something that works one way, clamps them the other way, so that nothing gets through. Well, as a matter of fact, I don't. I have the, have something like my fingers. I have a grid of wires in here. And you see, the grid is in at this angle, and when I hold a paddle like that, the grid's horizontal. When I flip the, like that, the grid goes vertical. So the trick is you put this in at 45, and you can go from complete reflection to complete transmission. Now, let's con extend the experiment. I cross-polarize the receiving antenna. Nothing is coming through, and I'll now put in this grid of wires at a 45 degree angle. And you see, signal comes through because the grid is this way and the field was polarized like that, but the only field that can get through is at this angle, so it lets the field through that way, and that has a component in this direction of the receiving horn. If I put a couple of these, or a series of them, I could rotate the field as much as I wanted to, so the grid can serve a number of purposes. Now, you're all members of the IEEE. How many of you are? Let's see. I'd like to report to New York that it's 100%. Oh, golly. Um, uh, well, Spectrum is their magazine, in case you didn't know that. Um, a very excellent publication. The IEEE is the largest professional organization in the world, and um, they, they do a tremendous job. The spectrum is very good, very clear, transparent. <laughs> Comes right through. Uh, by contrast, here is the Ohio State University Graduate School Bulletin. <laughs> you know, don't you? <clears throat> Tough school. Well, um, it's uh, maybe hard going, but there's there's really must be more to it than that. And if I look through here carefully, there we find it—an aluminum sheet that did it. <laughs> Now, here's this polarization again. You notice, cuts out. Now, if I put in this thing here, it looks like a 100 millimeter cigarette, but this one's better for you than the real kind, and see what happens. Keeps right on going. <clears throat> I've overcome the polarization problem by putting in this little paper cylinder a helical antenna for three centimeters, <clears throat> and it makes this a circularly polarized receiving antenna so that this will receive any linear polarization equally well. Now, engineers are always interested in gain how are we going to get another 10th dB gain? Let's get more gain, put bigger antennas up, crank up the transmitter, all this stuff. And so 
you, you want to lay down a big field out there, um, or if you have a fixed field, what do you do to increase it? Well, you get more aperture. Here's a 